Our next speaker is Patrick Dixon. Now, mobile technology is one of the fastest growing industries here in Poland and the rest of the CEE area. And here to tell us how mobile is changing the e-commerce business landscape is our next speaker, Patrick. Now, Patrick, if you've ever seen him before, has a background in medicine. He's also branched out to write subjects as diverse as online churches, designer babies, and why market research doesn't yeah, help you to fun. predict yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Patrick advises yeah, big businesses on key trends, managing uncertainty, identifying risk, and developing opportunities. And he's got an amazing array of clients from Google, Microsoft, Ford, Gillette, GSK, Forbes, Tetra Pak, BT, amongst many others. Now, the Times named him as the 20 most influential business thinkers, so it's time to take hold of the future before it takes hold of you. He's welcome backstage. Please go wild and crazy for the one and only Patrick Dixon. Hello, Patrick. Nice to see Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Well, what a roller coaster ride from James. What a tremendous uh, introduction to the future. And what I want to do now is to take us on a more near term view of the future, in particular, playing to the interests that many of you have about the future of customers and the future of e commerce. And it's a great, exciting city, this one, and, uh, and meeting you guys and all the different companies and initiatives and innovations that you're developing right now. But you know, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're the biggest bank in the world, or whether you're the Pentagon, or whether you are uh, uh, a government, it doesn't matter who you are, the greatest risk that you face in your future is institutional blindness. It's when too many people from Google spend too much time with other people from Google. It's when too many bankers spend too much time with other bankers. And what I want to do today is to take off our glasses and to put on our customers' glasses to think about the future. Now, most innovation happens, of course, on the outer edge of the radar screen. But when James asked the question about strategy, strategy is usually about what's happening at the center. But what I want to look at today is the outer edge. Uh, what is happening uh, in terms of innovation and change. And there is one word which will drive the future. In fact, there is one word that underpins every single trend that you have just heard about. There's one word which has driven the last 2,000 years and will drive the next 10,000 years. What is that word? It's not demographics. Demographics is a part of it. It's not politics. You know, you can change the politicians, but not much actually happens. Uh, you can, it's not a question of uh, even of social movements or of Wikipedia. Uh, it's not even a question of technology. This word will drive technology, it will drive the choices that are made. At the moment, there is a great debate about the right size of a screen. Is it a tiny thing in your eye? Is it a, a, a huge a thing which is so big you can no longer carry it in your pocket? Uh, we can think about integrating chips and processes into our brains themselves. Actually, I'm a, I'm a physician. So I'm really interested in ways to enhance intelligence. And I can tell you that it is absolutely true. One in five students in my country and in the US are using drugs already to improve their memory. And I, I, th I think it is absolutely correct that drug improvement of the brain will be a huge market in the future for people uh, of, of the age group in this room. But I want to ask a question. You see, here is a chip. This chip uh, is coated with brain cells from a human being. They are human brain cells, and they are growing on the surface of this chip. Uh, here is uh, the chip surface. You can see it has special coating to capture brain cells. And these brain cells, they put out little feelers, and they start to talk to each other. And they, when they sense an electrical activity on the surface of the chip, they think they found another brain cell. Your brain is genetically programmed to communicate with chips. Every brain cell automatically recognizes chips as other 
brain cells. There are mice and rats in laboratories with chips inside their brains. So they can communicate and email virally by thinking alone. They are able to send a thought to another animal, saying, I'm thirsty. 2,000 kilometers away, the message is received. If the mouse responds in the right way and gives him some water, this friend sends him some food. Now, the question is this. This is obviously primitive, but I'm telling you history. This was done 15 years ago, and the work has accelerated. So, put your hands up if you would like a chip inside your own brain. Put your hands up if you are certain that you do not want a chip inside your brain and you do not want your children to have chips inside their brains. Interesting. You see, we learn something really important about the most important driver of the future. What is this word? This word, my friends, is emotion. It's passion. Because as I was communicating about these chips in brains, I saw you beginning to react. You were thinking, but also feeling. And although a few of you put up your hands and said, yes, great, chip in my brain, most of you said, I'll take the drug. <laughs> most of you said, I want to be more intelligent, but I do not want to have a chip actually fused into my brain. So we learned that you can have the greatest technology innovation in the world and it will fail unless it also connects with emotion. So that is the key. That emotion tells you whether Greece will stay in or out of the euro, I promise you. Emotion will tell you the future of China. It's be the reaction in terms of social instability and so on, as we heard. Emotion tells you what kinds of drugs will actually fi find the greatest traction or not. So, and here is another example of where uh, we, we see a lot of emotion <laughs> in terms of the ticking clock. We heard about the acceleration of time, both in, uh, from our friend here, but also in the presentation you just heard. Here is a question. Last night, Imagine that you're watching TV, and as you watch TV, you're looking at the iPad, and you're looking up the uh, biography of your favorite actor. And you've pressed on Google, you're waiting for his own web page to load, and you're waiting. One second, two second. <laughs> Put your hands up if you press the back button in less than five seconds. You see, in Poznan today, this is incredibly important. In Poznan today, 95% of all web customers disappear in five seconds. Put your hands up if you press the back button in three seconds. One, two. Life's short. Three seconds is almost a million years in web time. Five seconds is certainly an eternity. Next question. Imagine that you have just received a bill from the electricity company and you discover they have stolen 2,300 uh, 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 zloty and in fact the previous month they stole 15,000 zloty from your account. So now you're phoning them up, you get through to them on the phone and they press one for accounts, press two for customer services. Put your hands up if you find that really annoying when you get through to these buttons. Okay. Keep your hands up if you think it is so annoying that people who install such systems should be put in prison. <laughs> Why? Because five seconds is a million years. Three seconds is also a painful loss of time. It's emotion. It's passion. Uh, next question. I won't ask you to put up your hands here. <laughs> but many of you here have robot systems like this. In fact, every single telco company I talk to, every IT company I talk to, has such systems. So what happened? What happened was we have one pair of glasses when we go to work, and then the moment we become accustomed, we have another pair of glasses. Three seconds pressing buttons is enough to make us really angry as a customer, and yet we go straight to work and we start installing such systems for our own customers. What is this? 
is blindness, institutional blindness. We need to connect with the emotions that we feel as human beings and use that to understand how our customers feel. I promise you this, this five-second test, this three-second test, shows you the future of e-commerce. If you can take three seconds, three seconds, of a 10-minute process to buy a product, you're already winning market share. So let's look at retail. Up to 70% of retail spending in my country is just with seven or eight companies. It's the same in Finland, in Denmark, in Sweden, in France, and it will be in Poland soon. Very few companies will control almost all of retail spending. The big question is, what happens to the rest? At the same time, we are seeing massive consolidation of retail into shopping malls like the one at the back here. And why is that? Well, for a whole host of reasons. You see, it's big chains, big products, big discounts, big volume, and the small people get squeezed and melt away. And the web is accelerating this process dramatically because, of course, wandering around the shopping center, I take one look at a product, and a few seconds later, I have 50 different places. I can buy this product, saving 100 euros. So why would I buy it in the store? And this is putting huge pressure on retailers to have to find a different purpose in life. 65% of all the population of this country are already online. We have 7 million smartphone users already in Poland. 100% of all future sales of phones will be smartphones within the next three or four years. There is no doubt. We're talking about a 24 billion slotty uh, online sales market growing at more than 20% every year. This is an extraordinarily exciting time. Worldwide, we have seen $1 trillion bought online in the last 12 months. My friends, we are in the first hour of the first day of e-commerce. We've hardly started. 12% of all retail spending in my country is online. 3 4 or 5% here. Poland is the fastest growing e commerce market in the whole of the European Union. So yes, you are going to see really big companies come in uh, quite quickly, I think, over the next 24 months. It is such an exciting place. But the biggest driver on the e-commerce is one single thing, which I, I've already shown you with the, with the mobile device. It's comparing price. And not just of products, but also of services. If we look at the sales of car insurance in Italy, we've seen a, a rise of 58% in online sales using price comparison sites, where one click, one form completed, gets sent to over 100 different insurers, because five seconds is an eternity, and it can take 20 minutes to fill in the form for every single insurer, so the insurers have made it so difficult to apply for a product that they are more or less forcing people to go to a price comparison site. One form, one entry, submitted to every company and let them compete. And this is putting huge pressure on the UK insurance market. It's the same in the US, it's the same in Italy, and it will be the same here in Poland. And of course, in Poland, here we are seeing rapid, dramatic growth of price comparison sites of just about every kind, with 12.5 million users of Allegro alone. Um, and the retailers are having to think again. So retailers are having to create theater, uh, opportunity, experience, to demonstrate the product. But of course, it's still a challenge, because once someone has seen the product, if you're not careful, they go out of the store and they order it elsewhere, or they even order it inside the store. And yet, the fact is that actually people enjoy shopping, physical shopping. They enjoy to touch, feel, to taste, uh, to smell, uh, to, to hear, uh, to see other people, uh, to sit in a cafe and watch the world go by. And it's leisure retail 
which is the answer to the physical retail market. It's creating this experience, this destination, this fun, uh, this place where the children can have uh, an adventure in a swimming pool at the top of the, of the shopping center. This is in Bulgaria, uh, where I was last week, and so on. And at the same time, people are not only comparing prices, of course, but they are also talking talking with their friends, talking on the phone for advice, but also Twittering, they are Facebooking, actually in the store, they're doing it live, they are checking you out, they are informing each other. Uh, at least 75% of all physical decisions are now being influenced in my country by social media. Uh, if you type uh, the name of a hotel into uh, Google, of course, the first thing that comes up in many countries is TripAdvisor. I want you to imagine that you have been booked to stay in London, and at, a, at a, what looks like a great hotel. And the first listing on Google is about this fantastic uh, experience. The second is about uh, rats, insects, dirty, and I nearly died. Okay. And on the right-hand side, we have here the pay-for-click ad, which Google is forcing the hotels to, to, uh, to adopt because Google is really uh, filling out the listings with social media, partly as a commercial decision. So you have one choice, you have one click. Where are you going to go to find the truth about the hotel? Are you going to go to uh, this one here, uh, the fantastic, perfect experience? Are you going to go for the story about the rats? Or are you going to go for the official marketing department's uh, uh, information and the letter from the CEO? Put your hands up if you go straight for the wonderful story. Okay, three. Put your hands up if you go straight for the rats. Okay, most of you. And put up your hands if you don't believe either of them and you go for the marketing department. Well, of course, that's true, because who wrote the first story? The hotel, yes. And who wrote the second story? The well, the competition, yes. <laughs> now, of course, you knew that. You knew that, uh, 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 that the competition probably wrote this one, and this one is also not to be believed. But I can promise you, having polled at least 100,000 people in the last year or two on this slide, that almost everyone will go straight for the story about the rats. Because of the power of social media. We believe the story of a stranger more than the CEO, the chairman, the president of your country, the prime minister, whoever it is, we will believe an opinion of a stranger, even if we think the opinion of a stranger has been written by a competitor. It's very strange. It's all to do with emotion. A mobile, therefore, is about more than a channel. It's about a total immersion experience. It's about um, a, just a way of thinking about customers. It's a way of thinking about customers in their place, wherever they are. Thinking about what they're thinking about. Looking over their shoulder, whispering in their ear. And mobile means that um, in a time, time shortage world that people have time to watch a TV program in 40 seconds going up an escalator. Mobile means that um, people are no longer dependent, of course, on where they are. By the way, is this, uh, this is someone working at home. A man or woman, what do you think? Man, okay. Where is he? I'll give you a clue. He's not there. He's not been there for 20 minutes. In the toilet, of course, he's in the toilet. Now, why has he been in the toilet for 20 minutes? What is he doing in there? <laughs> Someone says he's reading the newspaper. What do you think? He's reading. He actually, you know what? I think he's talking to his boss. <laughs> his boss didn't know where he was. He says, hi, how are you, James? Hello. <laughs> no. <laughs> And he's talking to his boss. His boss thinks he's working at home in front of the screen. I've just sent you an email. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> Can he tell his boss that he's sitting on the toilet with his trousers down? No. But actually, it's the most important fact his boss needs to know. Because actually, I tell you this, if it isn't his boss, imagine it's a telesales person from the electricity company. <laughs> It's really important to understand what kind of mood people are in, what they are doing, who they are with, where they have come from, and that's why location marketing is the next big thing, by overwhelming huge thing, in terms of how we relate to our customers. It's understanding uh, the fact that I've just got into the taxi. This is in Sofia. I'm in uh, Sofia, not in London, okay? I've just got into a taxi in Sofia. The taxi has read my glasses. The glasses has an, a radio frequency identification device, a grain of sand, 
uh, attached to an aerial, a tiny chip, which allows the taxi to see the model, the make, and where this, this was manufactured, and maybe when it was bought. So they can see that this is a, a, a brand name, a high high-value brand name glasses, they can see that it's bifocal, it has two lenses. This tells them that I am over the age of 50 because I need glasses for reading, okay? It tells them that I like big brands, it tells them that I'm male, um, and just with that information, it allows the taxi's screen to change. And it, the, the taxi has been uh, displaying news to me, and the ad is for laser correction eyesight. Now, I don't need to know how the taxi decided to display that ad, but it just did. Was it breaking my privacy? Not really. Uh, did I need to give the taxi permission? It's already happening. Uh, is this happening, beginning to happen all over the world? It's part of the experience. Whispering in your ear along the journey of life, not marketing at you, but just whispering in your ear about things that might be helpful, relevant, and so on. Now, here's another example. I'm telling you history. I want you to tell me the future. I'm showing you things that are working. They are here. The big question is where you think they're going to go in Poland by when. Here is another example. Coca-Cola has already got this machine. Okay, uh, you, can, you can set up uh, your own perfect drink. It's a variation of a standard Coca-Cola drink, mixed for you. And it's stored in the cloud. And as you walk around, Coca-Cola sends you a text saying you are 15 meters from the Coca-Cola 20. You're 25 meters. Turn around. <laughs> as you go back, it says that we're preparing your favorite drink. Clonk, bonk. I pick it out. As I pick it out, it all happens because the Coca-Cola machine knows my phone is near. As, it ha as I pull the thing out, I automatically make the transaction on my phone. It's already approved. And what about, it's about the Internet of Things. It's about one trillion new devices being put into the environment every 12 months. Uh, each of them attached to the things that you wear. We're talking about a world where in a room this size there could well be 10 or 15,000 such devices in a few years' time. Already, you're already carrying some of these devices, you just don't know it. And if you had a reader, you could learn extraordinary things about the person sitting next to you. Say, I like the belt, but pity about the shoes. How do you know that? Because of scanners. Scanners can detect all kinds of things from these things. We're talking about a fusion of the online and the offline worlds. Uh, an ordinary shopper walking around, online, physical, the worlds become one. Buying online, deliver to the store. Buy to the store, deliver at home. Go to the store, research and order online and have it delivered to another store. Uh, you know, delivery of stuff is becoming a huge problem. It's a massive new market opportunity in Poland right now. In the UK last year, 1.3 billion packages had to be delivered to people's homes because they had bought so much stuff online. Only problem is, no one's at home. They're all at work. So what do you do now? That is why, um, th that is why uh, there is now an explosion of a new trend which has come from Germany. It's already starting, I think, here, and it will, I believe, dominate e-commerce in Poland within the next 10 years. Just in the last 12 months, in the UK, we have seen 3,000 small retailers. These are the kind of stores which are under pressure, ones that might close soon because of a big outlet. They are looking for a new purpose in life, and now along comes e-commerce. And what's happening is they are registering with the central software. They have a sign saying, please, direct your parcel to my shop. And uh, these parcel shops are chosen by up to 50% of customers. When they have the opportunity, 50%, listen folks, 50% of all e-commerce in the UK in the last 12 months has moved from A to B, from home delivery to near home delivery. That's potentially, that's potentially, we're talking about seven or eight hundred million packages going to near home delivery in the next 12 months, every 12 months. And we're only in the first hour of the first day of e-commerce. It's a very big change. And, of course, you see, the problem about e-commerce is it's so slow. If you order a product online, how long does it take to come to your home? 
next day. Ah! Remember, five seconds is like a million years. Next day, I'll go to the corner shop. If I'm ever in a hurry, of course, I want it now. And that is why the next trend that's already happening, and it's just been launched in the UK, and it's already here in Germany and elsewhere, is now same-day delivery. Moving to one-hour delivery in the same city. How is that happening? It's happening because in most cities there are courier companies. There are students on bicycles, or there are people who've got a spare car, whatever it is. There are grids, networks of couriers, and most couriers are not used. They're sitting around waiting for business, and these companies can feed in lots of extra job to couriers in Poznan. So they phone them up, say the product's here, come and collect it. So they go to the uh, local store, collect it, and take it to where you are. Wherever you are, one hour delivery, wherever you are. You might be at work, you might be sitting waiting for a train in the station. Wherever you are to find the product and deliver it to you. That is actually what, products, what the customers actually need in a world where five seconds can lose 95% of your business. So it's a change and I want now to talk about how we pay for it. How do we move from a world from where cash is so incredibly expensive? Cash costs us billions of euros every year to handle. Um, and, uh, of course, the alternatives are terrible. How long does it take you to pay for something using a credit card online? What do you think? Ten minutes. <laughs> Ten minutes, five seconds is eternity. Life is too short. We have to find a better way. Now, here is an interesting fact. 70% of all mobile payments are happening in one part of the world, which is Africa. And 70% of those are happening in just one country, which is... Nigeria. Actually, it's Tanzania, funnily enough, but a good guess, because t uh, uh, Nigeria has 140 million people and is growing at an incredible speed. But it's little Kenya which is doing it. Kenya, if we look at Kenya, we find that... Uh, let me just have a look here. Uh, Kenya has 17 million customers using the MPSA network. M-Pisa is trading, this single network, this single network is trading one-third of Kenya's GDP. One-third of the entire economy on one tiny platform. My global banking clients are worried about Kenya. They see that Kenya and M-Pisa are rewriting the models of future retail banking. They see that the future of banking is being developed in Africa and in Asia amongst people who are almost all offline. And at the same time, in countries like ours here, uh, they're also seeing a whole new generation of traders who go and buy, well, they get given one of these. This is a pay leaven thing. It costs me nothing. I just pop it in here, and two minutes later, I can take a credit card payment as, uh, as a marketer selling books on the street at zero cost, very little cost to me, very little cost to me. Uh, but we come back to Kenya and what's happening here. You see, one of my clients is Singtel in Singapore. Singtel has 450 million mobile phone customers worldwide, most of them in emerging countries. 200 million of them, I think, are completely unbanked. They have never managed to save anything in any account, they never have any insurance, they can't transfer money, and then along comes a smartphone app, and suddenly they can bank, they've got insurance, they've got a whole host of products, they've got credit, they've got loans, they are inside the entire global system, and there's 1.7 billion mobile phone users today who need this kind of technology. So you can see why it is that the volumes are going to be huge, and why it is that systems like this will also turn out to be very important here in Poland, in Russia, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan. I don't care where you are in the region, and I've been to almost the entire region here and worked in this region. You will see these kinds of things happening. And when you couple it with the latest fingerprint technology, which allows you with a single, ma a single f uh, fing fingerprint, ideally, to have a transaction for 100,000 euros at the speed of light, at almost zero cost, 
with almost perfect security, much more secure than anything you could possibly do with a credit card, then we're beginning to see a payments revolution. And what about the future of the credit card? Just think about this. In the UK alone, we're looking at transactions of $1 trillion a year on cards. And we're looking at a credit card debt of $100 billion. We're looking at an average credit card interest rate of 16%, even though the cost of getting that money in the wholesale market is only about half a percent or 1% or 2%. And we're talking about commissions, just 2% commissions. On that is worth $18 billion. Wow. So there is a, a really interesting development taking place. And you know, most questions about the future are not questions, as James will agree, about what's going to happen. It's simply a question of when. Most, most business decisions in your strategy are not actually about what your strategy should be. It's about timing, about being not too early, not too late, seizing the opportunity, knowing when now is the time. Here is a question about timing. Uh, look at this. This is a world where the cost of providing mobile phones, iPads, unlimited video calls, and so on, and all the entertainments that you want, the cost of providing it is falling towards zero according to Moore's law, and that will continue. But the cost of the income that we can capture uh, using the latest technology and software from financial transactions is rising at a very dramatic point. And the big question is, in each country, in here, in Poznan, for example, what will be the year when these two lines cross? And what happens here? And I show this graph to uh, the boards and senior teams of many of the largest banks in the world, many of the largest telcos in the world, and I ask them a question. The first question is, uh, uh, wh what is the year at which this line crosses? And the second is, what happens to your business? And let's imagine what happens when the line crosses. What we're talking about here is a bank or a telco, and they come, uh, they come to uh, you, uh, they come to Matthews, and they say, "Hi, Matthews, I've got a fantastic opportunity for you. I know you love Mac. You know what? It's a Mac Air, but I think it's at least three months old. Would you like a new one?" Maybe you have got someone else in your family that like one. I tell you what we will do. We will give you another one of these. We will replace it with the latest model every 12 months. And I see you also like the iPhone. That's great. Pity it hasn't got fingerprint sensor. Never mind. We will give you one with fingerprint sensor technology. We will change it every 12 months. We'll give you two iPhones, okay? One for a, another member of your family. In addition, we will give you free video calls. We will give you unlimited European roaming for voice calls. A little bit extra to phone him in the US. Actually, we'll give you a satellite TV package. So many technologies that you could want. We will give you free ball brand at home. We will give you, um, we'll give you a very nice Wi-Fi package, which is free around the whole city where you live. We will give you just about whatever you could possibly want. Only one condition. Can you give me your wallet? <laughs> He's not sure. <laughs> okay. well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. You can choose a card. I don't mind which card you want to choose. That's absolutely fine, but you can only keep one. It's just for emergencies, and you can spend up to, oh, let's say, a thousand slotty a month, a month, just for emergencies. And if you agree just to keep one card, and you will cut up in front of me now all the other cards in your pocket, and you agree that all the other transactions that you make will now go through our system, then just sign. Now, the big question is, my first question to telco companies and banks is, put your hands up if you think that could happen. Some big companies will start to do that kind of offer within the next 10 years. And of course, they all put their hands up. Then I say, put your hands up if you think it could happen in the next five. And about half of them put their hands up. I say, you're all wrong. It's already happening. These models are already starting in Singapore, in the US, and Europe, and so on, because the technology is so cheap. Next question is, what happens? what happens to the orange shop, which is 100 meters away that I videoed last night? What happens to their model? Because they can't sell any technology anymore. Why? Because it's all free, so long as you tear up your credit cards, 
So it's the end of telcos in the traditional sense. Actually, what happens to retail banking? Because the retail banking transactions are now being held by the person who owns the relationship. So it's a completely different way of thinking about telcos, about banks, and it all generates a huge amount of data. In fact, the most important part of the entire relationship may be nothing to do with the commissions or the loans. Or, uh, it's the fact that they know. They now know how often you walk down the shopping center outside. They know which shops you usually walk into. They know which taxi you usually f use and probably which firm of taxes you use. They know whether you are early or late for work on Mondays or Wednesdays. They know. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I like them to know all this. Well, if you want, you can turn it off. But of course, they'll start to charge you. Say, look, we just want to be your friend. Mathieu, I just want to be your friend. I promise you, I will not sell your information to any other person on the earth, okay? It will be held by my company. I promise you, we will never market to you. We will never, ever try to sell you anything. My promise. But I'd like to be able to offer you advice. <laughs> so I know you like Starbucks. And actually, looking at the transactions, you haven't been in a coffee shop for 14 days. <laughs> so I send you some advice. Say, hey, Matthias, your favorite shop, 100 meters to the left. <laughs> By the way, I've got a little discount for you. It's a little present we've managed to negotiate. 10% off in the next five minutes. Yours, Patrick. It comes from me. Because it's, I'm your personal advisor. Yes, of course, you know it's automated. But I set up the thing with you. It was me in front of me that you cut your cards. And we, we agreed, you and I agreed, how many times I or my robot would communicate with you, how many times a day, and the kind of offers you wanted, and the kind of level of information you want us to store about your transactions. And you're phoning me up every day. You say, hey, Patrick, you just saved me 500 euros in the last six weeks. <laughs> how come you're always right? You just seem to know what I'm feeling, not just what I'm thinking. And that's really, as we've heard earlier, what big data is all about. It's about putting this whole picture together. You may remember the Enron scandal. Do you remember the Enron scandal back in 2000? Did you know that that was cracked through big data? It's one of the first examples of it. The analysts started to crunch all the way through hundreds of thousands of transactions. And the computer algorithm noticed something weird. It noticed three or four really bad deals had really strange names. They were all names of very rare birds. So after that, they just loaded up of, uh, a list of all the rarest birds in the world, and suddenly, bang, 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 out came the other 50 bad transactions. Big data. It solves crime. Big data. Military are using it all the time to track terrorists. Big data shows you extraordinary opportunities that you would never have imagined. Big data allows you to be a friend, not a beating someone around the bush with marketing. You know, marketing is dead in an online world. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that's a little exaggeration, but you remember I showed you that TripAdvisor, the story about the rats. Imagine that I was the owner of that hotel, and I've just spent $1 billion advertising on TV on, across the whole of Poland, advertising my London hotel. I know what will happen. The number of Google searches will go through the roof. Every time the ad is shown, the Google searches go up. Every time there's Google searches, more people learn about rats. Therefore, the more money I spend marketing, the more I damage my brand. But when the social media thing's right, then of course, marketing helps itself. So big data means a shift from marketing to creative advice. Big data means a shift in a world where actually it's becoming quite difficult to target your customers using big campaigns in the old way. For example, one in three people in my country don't watch any TV anymore. They watch it using time lapse uh, on sites like the BBC, which means they also skip the ads. <laughs> so we have to think about a whole new way of, of uh, 
and focusing on a customer, a multi-channel customer, a multi-dimensional customer who is at home at and at work at the same time, who is online and offline at the same time, who is entertaining and in sales at the same time, who is in leisure and also thinking about life at the same time, uh, who, is, uh, who is online on a website where they want to chat, but they also want a phone call, where they've got 50 web pages open at the same time, and your telesales operator has nothing except the script in front of them. In many call centers, the call center person is completely blind. They're not even online, or the only web they can see is their own site. We're talking about a world where we need to catch up with where our customers are, understand how they think and feel, and then we can guide them on the journey of life and give them a fantastic experience, cut a huge amount of cost, save them a massive amount of time, and make them very happy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.